She goes, every time you say to the, your team, my backhand sucks, everyone around you believes that you, and then they don't trust you. And you're putting arrow, you're giving them arrows to shoot you with, and you're putting blood in the water for them to attack you because you're telling them what's wrong with you. She goes, so you're, she's like, so you're, only thing, you're never allowed to speak against yourself on the court again. And and every time you want to speak against yourself, you have to say, I'm becoming a champion. I'm becoming a fucking champion. You are becoming a champion. There's something I'm like, I'm becoming a champion. She's like, you're becoming a fucking champion. Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy with yours truly, Michael Kahan. This lady is a gem. She's funny, insightful, wise, humble, and resilient. Arden was an absolute joy to speak to. You can see why she's been in the industry for so long and achieved so much in her life. A wonderful conversationalist who has a great soul. I also love her go-with-the-flow attitude, a trait I look to emulate. I had a blast, and I know you will too. So let's get into it and officially introduce today's superstar. Arden Marine is a true comedian slash wizard who's mastered all the formats of comedy, where she's a pro at stand-up, sketch, and improv. She's also a well-accomplished actor, writer, and author, and was most recently a cast member on the hit Netflix series Insatiable, which was named one of the 10 most binge shows on Netflix, where she played the role of Regina Sinclair. She's also been a cast member on Shameless, appeared on Chelsea lately over a hundred times, and was also a cast member on Mad TV. Her television credits include Orange is the New Black, Insecure, Grey's Anatomy, Fresh Off the Boat, Inside Amy Schumer, Key and Pill, Conan, and Howard Stern. She also has an extensive theatre career, appearing in Barbecue and Boston Marriage at the Public Theatre in New York, and the pre-Broadway run of Steve Martin's Tony-winning play, Media Shower. Her upcoming projects include Space Oddity, the Megan Griffiths film Year of the Fox, and is also voicing the part of Brittany in the Daria spin-off movie Jody. As a writer, she sold pilots to Adult Swim, Hold a Hole, and MTV Bottom Feeders. She's also the author of the memoir Little Miss Little Compton. If you'd like to buy it, check it out in the links below. It sounds amazing. She's also written a screenplay called Space Girl that is in pre-production. And believe it or not, we're not quite done yet. Arden also headlines as a stand-up comedian at comedy clubs and festivals all over America. She also hosts the popular podcast, Will You Accept This Rose? And is about to debut another podcast called Lady of the Road, Celebrating Female Leaders. So as you can imagine, we dive deep and we cover a lot, such as getting a fake ID to perform improv, her parents marrying on a dare, protecting your magic and trusting your gut, a start on Conan, grief, and her feeling it to healing it approach, Bobby Lee's intervention for her, going back to stand-up comedy, balance, and being a fucking champion. Also, before we get into this chat, in case you aren't aware, the videos are now available on YouTube under Michael Kahan. That's Kahan with a K, unless you're listening to it already. I find it adds a new element and dynamic to these chats. I'll still be posting snippets of these chats on Instagram under Funny and Failure, so check them out if you want to stay in the loop for upcoming episodes or you want to ask a guest a question. I'd also love it if you would share the podcast or share your takeaways from the chat. It really motivates me, helps the podcast grow, and ensures I can lock in amazing guests like this one. And just as a final reminder, the podcast comes out every Monday at 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time with the video to follow the following day. Anyway, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's epic episode. My weird last name is pronounced Marine. Yes, I actually, (laughs) you have done the most podcasts I've ever seen. And (laughs) I wrote down Marine. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, no, I can't, but nobody, nobody ever, everybody, everybody always is embarrassed because they're like, I've called you the wrong name for years. And it, I could not, we have a Y in your name. You can't be fussy about it. What are you going to do? That's fine. But I've got a very basic name, Michael, and sometimes people get that wrong. So I can only imagine. What do they call you? Like Mikhail, Mikhail, I've heard <laughs> Michelle, Mikhail. Yeah. Like Everyone's garbage. 
<laughs> oh, yeah, Everyone's lost in their own stew of their own. They're just thinking yeah. about themselves. That's true. <laughs> I, Listen, Michelle, I'm so time. excited to do this. <laughs> um, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what else? This could be an interesting place to start. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But yes. did you, ha when you were doing improv, when you first started improv, did you have to do it via fake ID? Yes. Yes. Please tell I me was, about that. Um, thank you for asking. I was, uh, I was 19 years old and I was in Chicago and I was the very first intern ever at Improv Olympic, which turned into IO. I was Sharna Halpern's first ever intern very and cool. it was before they had their own theater. So it was in uh, Wrigleyville, right near Wrigley Field. And it was at this uh, upstairs um, above the sports bar called the Wrigley side. And um, in order to perform there and in order to even like at first I like took tickets and stuff like that. Um, you, it, it's, a, it's a bar. So I was, I had just turned 19. And so I got, I don't know how I got my hands on some woman from Montana that was much older than me. How did you find her? <laughs> I have no idea. I still have the ID somewhere. And I was a pretty baby faced. I was a pretty baby faced brand new 19. You know, I was not a sophisticated looking 19. I was a pretty young looking 19. And I had this like adult, like businesswoman. <laughs> <laughs> like Minnesota life. It's like you're Somehow. a different shade of human, yeah. like yeah, it's like, stash and yeah. it's me, Diane. <laughs> um, I'm auditing you. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I had this fake ID that uh, I would have to show every time to get into the bar. And if I look back on it, they knew my name was Arden. Like it's a different name. <laughs> I was I said like Michelle or something. You know what I mean? Thinking about it. Oh my god, I think I actually I think I have it right back. Yes. I could probably find yes, it. Should I look for great. it? Whole place. Hold, please, Australia. Hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is it out here? Wait, is it out of these books? Is this the book? Hold on. Hold, please. There's no rush whatsoever. <laughs> I need to see this. I need to see what it's you look in like. Here. Oh, you got a folder. <sighs> All right. I collect, yes. So, yes, at the time, I'll chat while I glance through for my. Um, at the time, you know, Del Close, who was sort of the improv guru, like he he helped, like was one of the first like compass players and it was around like Nichols and May, like he was the guy and he was sort of like Adam McKay's guru and like all, it was like Amy Poehler and the UCB, Matt Besser, like they were, he, I, I was able to as a night, I was able to do all levels at once, like beginning, wow. middle and, it, which was good and bad. It was cool because I was able to sort of be around. The house team was Adam McKay and Neil Flynn, who was like on every sitcom ever. And it was Matt Besser, founder of UCB, and Ian Roberts, founder of UCB, and Horatio Sands. That was the house team. And um, and and it was all before they went to Second City. So a lot of people would do improv at IO and kind of get the training. And they were already, they'd already started UCB, but it was a different formation. Like Adam was a part of it. Um, they would do these things like at these Chinese restaurants where they, they would like film them. They would take an audience member and drive off in the car and film them. But they'd also pre-filmed. They made it look like the audience from the theater would run out. And they, there was like one audience member that had gone on the adventure with somebody in a car. And everybody would leave the restaurant and then come out. And the car would round the bend. And it would look like they'd hit like one of the actors, like like in a, like with the car when they got out there. Like they filmed it so it looked like he got hit. Wow. You know, it was all this stuff that it would. And then. You know, but nobody was making any money. So it was basically like they would get creatively ready at I.O. and then go to Second City yeah. to then make their money and get plucked generally by Lauren Michaels. Um, but Saturday like when Night I Live? Yeah, for Saturday Night Live. Oh, my God. Look at this. <laughs> So I don't know if you knew. No, this is this is just a different photo. I'm a childhood ginger. Look at this like ghost of I, I also grew up in a town. My friends say that I'm a time traveler from the 1600s. <laughs> okay. Look at this. Look at this child. Oh, wow. Ever, look at this ghost. Look at that like ghost like I see dead people. The eyes, but I like all the trophies behind as well. Look how like who has like where's all that silver from? <laughs> look how much like a mushroom helmet of hair. You must have okay. like brought it with you in whatever timeline you were from. <laughs> I came from. Oh, my God. Here it is. Oh, my God. New York State. Hold, please. Let me find her. Oh, 
Rochelle, Rachel, Rachel, I just did to you. <laughs> I just did to you. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. I don't know how I got her ID. No, she was actually kind of looked like me, I guess. There she is. Look at her. That's it. I don't know why I kept it. I don't that know is she, hilarious. I, I don't know who she is or how I got my hands on it. But did you know like a friend who knew of someone or you bumped into someone? Because this is just, did you just go in the show and like, hey, can I get your ID? And like, sure, Arden, why not? I, I have no concept of how I procured this. I have no idea. I have no idea where, how I got a hold. Look, I, 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 and I, you know, when you're like 19, you, you're going to get a fake ID. You well, know what I mean? If you want one, you're going to get one. When, <laughs> when we used to go clubbing, I was 18, but all of my friends were a little bit younger. And yeah. all three of them had the same ID. And we all oh came in together. <laughs> did it, did anybody pretty, notice? Well, I think the third guy got caught because he's like, wait, I've seen this ID. The two guys <laughs> right before you. They could have yeah, done it so second. much better and waited or gone back in the line, but... You know. I saw this ID four seconds ago. Oh my God. <laughs> so crazy. So yes, I did have a fake ID and that's how I did improv. That's how I was able to perform and to like take the tickets and stuff like that. I have many questions. Yes, so you're sir. from a little town, little Compton. How did you even yeah. know about improv? And then <laughs> maybe it wasn't even a thought that you needed the ID. There's a lot happening here. You leave this town straight into <laughs> improv. You need to source an ID. How did you know what to do? <laughs> Dude, it's honestly, when I look back, because when I bring friends to my town, they all become obsessed. With, they all think I'm exaggerating. First of all, they think I'm exaggerating the time traveler. Like it is preserved. It's really? like a, it's like, um, you know, in Jurassic Park, it's like the mosquito in the amber. This town is like, there's no stoplights. The only coffee shop is in a barn in an apple orchard. It's, uh, there's, um, my parents never had a key to our house. Like we, like, and they would leave their car keys unlocked with the key in the ignition to the cars like there's like <laughs> there's just there's a general store we had allegedly allegedly an illiterate chief of police that they kept vo voting back in allegedly <laughs> um <laughs> how did you sign off the, the paperwork no, just... <laughs> he just would drive around and give a thumbs up to everybody oh, that's um very nice so I always, I, it's all I ever, my parents had met in New York City, so I was aware of a larger world out there, and they married on a dare, they were co-workers, and then when they, and they never went on a date, and they married on a dare, and then they stayed married forever, and then when they wanted to have kids, my parents, <laughs> again, it all sounds like a lie, this is, this is who I am, this is how I was born, um, it's a lot. I feel like we're on a first date and I'm like over shit, like TMI. No, you like started great. off well and then it's like a lot. No, like, no, it, I, I, I didn't know any different. This is like, this is how I got formed. But like, <laughs> so they, um, when they wanted to have kids, my dad was like, I will live one of two places, Manhattan or Little Compton, Rhode Island. <laughs> okay. We're going to have to backtrack. We'll come back. How did he even know what Little Compton was? He had spent some summers there as a kid. Why and how? Out of all the it's places? One, it is sort of, it's a very tiny town. So look, most people go to Cape Cod or they'll go to like Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard or Maine or they'll go for this weird hearty few because there's no restaurants or stores or any. <laughs> there's a very hearty subset because it's magical. It's magical. It's, it's fireflies and oh. it's bike rides and it's stone walls and it's fields to cliffs to the sea i mean it's truly like everybody who finds it wants to be the last person who found it and then not let anybody in oh, that's like so cute. <laughs> it is so, tiny the population from what i saw in your book is was it 3.5 thousand yeah yeah that's tiny yeah. and then the last question on that yeah. On a dare. Please expand because I heard this and it just blew my mind. You don't <laughs> hear about that every day. How does that even, how does that conversation happen? Okay. So they worked together in New York. My dad was like a rascal. My mom was, my mom was like the cute, fun lady. Uh, they, they were all out like having cocktails, like around the holidays. Um, and, you know, 
with their coworkers in New York. You know, you're young, you're in the early 20s in New York, you're going up for drinks, like, and um, they were trying to figure out basically how to screw over the man, like how to fuck over the fuck the man. Like, so you, everybody got two weeks vacation, but somebody figured out that there was like a clause at their company that if you went on a honeymoon, you got an extra two weeks vacation. So my dad was like, hey, Janet, how about this? You and I get married. I dare you to marry me. We'll get four weeks vacation. I'll pay us to go. I'll pay for us to like go on like a whirlwind trip down to like the islands and like Central and South America. And then we can fly back and we'll get it annulled. Like we'll screw over the company. We'll get a full month's vacation. Like we'll go up party for a month and then we'll come back and get it annulled. So they couldn't find like a Bible to swear on. So they swore on a cookbook. And then my mom <laughs> Oh. called him the next day and she upped the ante and she was like, I will do it, but I don't want to get it annulled. And then she had oh. a date that night with another guy Whoa. and she went, she went on it with him and she said she made out with him so hard because she knew he was going to be the last guy that she made out with. And apparently he was like pissed because he called for her, like, and her roommate was like, oh, she's engaged. And he was like, what the fuck? And then my grandparents never knew. They met my dad as my mom's fiance. They had a proper wedding six weeks later. And, like, my mom borrowed her best friend Arden. That's my namesake. She borrowed her friend Arden's wedding dress, and they got married. <laughs> they had, like, a wedding, and they went on their trip, and they stayed married till the end. That is very <laughs> That is a beautiful love story. You don't hear about that every day. No, you really I, don't. It, it's bananas. It's really, it's honestly truth be told. Look, I'm glad it happened. I would say anybody listening, they could have called the game earlier. Maybe not the best match. <laughs> but he, yeah, you know, it's fun, I guess. But I mean, you don't need to like stick it. Like it's like a game of chicken. Like they didn't have to stick it out forever, but they did. I, could, <laughs> I, I hear what you're saying, but I would imagine like, Please correct me if I'm wrong. Please. This is like a guy and he's like, mm -hmm. I, this woman is beautiful. I don't think yeah. I can just date her. I have to get her. She's so beautiful. I'm just going to have to marry her straight out. Like that's straight to I, the point. I do think they had crushes on each other yeah. and she was really cute and fun. And he, I think had like a twist. He was like the bad boy, you know, he was like the fun little, he looked just like John Belushi Ooh. and <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I think he was like, I think he was just, she had had her heart broken. Like she, so she'd gone through, she dated this guy that she was a year older in college. They were pinned. She graduated a year before him. She thought she was going to make, he was like safe, like tall and blonde, like the opposite of John Belushi physically. <laughs> and he was the safe choice. And then he like started dating somebody else. So I think there was a part of her, I think there was sort of a fun rebellion maybe. And like at that, in that era, I think even at like 23, she said she felt like an old maid, which is insane. Interesting. Yeah. I think like the goal was to get married. And I think she thought he was rich, which he was not because he had a cleaning person like once a month at his apartment. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Note to self, everyone get a cleaning person just when your date's coming over. Yeah. So, so when you were doing, so how did you find improv? What was going, um, going on? So in my mom, because so my mom had uh, brought us down to the city, like to New York, uh, starting at, like when I was like five years old, and she would bring us down. Her only requirement for my brother and I that were that each of us live in New York City for two years. She didn't <laughs> care if we went to college. She didn't care if we had a fancy degree. She just cared, she wanted both of us to go, live in New York City for two years because okay. she thought it. She felt like it. It. it you could see the whole world. You could see what was out there. She thought it was good for a person to go be on subways and like just deal with everybody. And then just, and then if it's not for you, it's not for you. But um, she thought it was important to go live there for two years. Mm. And so I was always sort of aware of this wider world. And then I had this, I had like, I had this older brother and I also have always been an insomniac. So like, and there was like no rules. So I, they would show me things I should never have seen as a child, but like, you know, they would record SNL and show it to me. And I would like steal, they, like, I was like six, you know, and they would show me like every Steve Martin movie ever, like, and the, the jerk and, uh, you know, and every Monty Python, they, every Monty Python movie when I was like six and seven, like, and then, and we didn't get, we hadn't, didn't have cable. So they only played like old movies. And so I was like, I want to be a Busby Berkeley girl, or I want to be Madeline Kahn, or I want to be, 
you know, I want to be like, um, what's her name from the, like Shirley McLean from the apartment or like, it was all these sort of like his girl Friday types or like Terry Gar. Like that was, we had access to very specific parts of culture. Like, and so I thought, okay, I want, I knew I wanted to entertain people to make people laugh, but in a way that was like young Frankenstein and like these classic kind of cool women, you know, like, and, and Mel Brooks, Madeline Kahn. And like, the, I wanted to be a comedian or whatever, like actress. Com- and so, um, honestly, I went to college in Colorado and I hated it. And I was so depressed that I didn't get my act together. <laughs> so like my grades plummeted. And I like, I applied to transfer places. I couldn't afford to transfer. I was so depressed. I like couldn't get it together to go do like an abroad program. And the one thing that the deadline that I didn't miss was this arts program in Chicago. And so I was like, thank God. And I have to say, like just in the failure, like every time for me, every roadblock I ever had was the door to what was the best thing that happened to me. Oh, that's amazing. So even like in high school, I always, the head of the theater department hated me and um, I could, she wouldn't cast me in things. And so I, but they had this one act play festival that no one was interested in, but they had this beautiful theater. So I just started writing my own plays and directing them. And then I would started winning awards for that. And like, which would piss, like I got all the awards, like, which made her angrier, but it was oh, like, great. again, be, but I only did it because I couldn't get cast in things. So it was like, okay, well then I'll make my own thing. Like, again, the gift of had I just gotten Audrey in Little Shop, I wouldn't have had to write a play. Like it was the gift of like, she would not cast me. <laughs> so that I was like, beautiful. yeah. And my mom also was so, she was the best. My, like she, my, it, everything good is from my mom. And she was like, you know what, Arden, you're a specific person. And a lot of, um, she saw what was happening with the theater teacher. And she's like, you, uh, you have a little unique sparkle. And she's like, and I bet she's like, don't, she actually told me, don't apply to NYU. Don't apply. Like, don't try to go to Juilliard or anything like that. She's like, they're not going to get it. And they're going to try to like dull down what's special about you. So she just kept saying like, just trust your gut and you piece together like the quilt of your own education and, and go toward, obviously you need, you obviously be teachable, but if somebody feels like, you know, we all have had these toxic professors or whatever figure, authority figures, if they start to feel dangerous in a way that, like you got to protect your magic and just get out of there. And Ooh. so I did. And so, and it was like intentionally, it was not a direct route. Like I didn't go to Northwestern. I didn't go to NYU. I didn't go to Yale. Like, but I, but I could build my own boat. She's like, you're gonna have to build your own boat. So you have to show people like, don't, you gotta, don't make people, don't give people what they want, make them want what you got. That's unique oh, to you. I love your mom. That She's the best. Side. She was the best. She was the best. Oh, okay, there's so many things, and I, and I jotted down a few points. But like one, teaching you to trust your gut, and two, yeah, everyone's. It's what I'm hearing is that she's telling you to embrace you, your individuality, and when you go through yeah. different systems, they yeah. can mold you into what they want. But she's yes. saying be you. Yes, and and be teachable. You know, like you can still be with good professors or whatever that challenge you. Um, and then it's even out in the world. Like, say you're lucky enough to start. I mean, it doesn't even have to be on a professional level. Yeah. Start like it's even true with collaborators. Like you go and then you know. We've all picked, you know, we've all look, it's it's almost like with dating, you know, like it could be great, you know, or like you don't or even like going on a trip with a friend or a road trip, like like create, I believe collaborating, whether it's in a class or in a work situation or just making something with your friends, like is the best thing ever, but you kind of don't know until you really, it's, I think it's actually one of the hardest dynamics of a relationship you can have. It's very intimate. And, and if it's just, even if it's somebody you're crazy about, I've had some of my favorite friends that we thought we were going to make something together and it's just not the right fit like that. And again, to preserve the friendship, it's like the, to allow that it's okay, like to call the game that not everybody has to be right. Like that you can trust your instincts of what, and again, it doesn't mean you have to have an escape hatch with everything. Cause you have to be able to willing to, things get messy, yep. but 
but just to trust of like, this is the right thing and I'm willing to like go through the bumpy, this is the right one, or this doesn't feel safe or right for, for me, or, or if it feels dangerous towards what's your unique gift to the world, I think it's important to protect your light in a way. Got a thousand questions. This has <laughs> happened to me as well. And I've had some crazy experiences with a friend, for example, love him, but it just wasn't the right person. But when you're going through it with someone that's so close to you and you create, you're creating what you want to be like your big break, or you want to be in the industry, there's so much stuff's involved. And it sounds like you were, you really kind of knew what you wanted. And then it, if someone you feel is taking you away from that, that can be quite hard, especially when there's a relationship involved. How yeah. did you kind of like navigate that? Cause that is tough. It's it, tough. Yeah. It's tough. Sometimes I always try to lead with kindness or in a light and a light touch and the benefit of the doubt and that you don't have to destroy somebody or trash them or talk about like, sometimes if you just honestly don't tend to it for a little bit, it can kind of just go away on its own. Mm. Like there doesn't have to have the, sometimes you don't have to have the, we got to talk. You know what I mean? Like sometimes <laughs> if you can just kind of like pump the brakes a little bit, like particularly if it's somebody that you want to have around. And, and I, I always try to lead with kindness or owning my part of like, you know, I thought like, you know, this isn't like, I, I it's even a re reality thing of like, I don't know that I have the bandwidth for this. Like, you know, it's just like looking at realistically, I thought that this was going to, you know, I was really excited to do this and I'm glad we gave it a go, but like, there's only so many hours in the week and like, I don't think this is the right thing, yep. but it's hard. I, oh my God, I have to call like three close friends before and after when <laughs> yeah, I have these chats. Oh my God, it's a whole process. But, but I, I, some of them, I do find if you don't tend like water the plant for a little bit, it, 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 it you know, it's stressful, but it can diffuse it for a little, a little bit. Can you, can you imagine if we did this in like a typical sexual relationship? Just don't talk to the, I know it's different. Just don't yeah, talk yeah. to them. Like it fizzles out. Like after yeah. like three years of being in a Oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You live with them. Just hope that maybe one day they'll just take their stuff from the apartment. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> just, just pretend that you didn't go on those trips and meet their family. Just pretend that it's just. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey. Hi, Colleen. Hi. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so so I ended up um I really feel like just following my own inner path. Like I'd never seen long form improv before. I didn't even know what it was. Like I didn't know I didn't I knew I wanted to be on SNL. I did not know I'd only seen sort of cheesy long form. And then I went and saw this one show at Improv Olympic and the level of talent that was there. It was, as I always said, it was Adam McKay, it was Matt Besser, it was Horatio Sands, um, Laura Kraft, it was uh, Rachel Dratch. Like, I just, my mind was blown because they were doing, bless you, like these full, like they were improvising full movies on, like, like they were, they were, at, they'd been there for a few years doing it. Like, you know, maybe they'd been working with Dell for like five or six years. They were like at the top, ready, about to go to Second City, about to go get plucked. And it, it was just the first time in my life where I was like, okay, I found my people. Here we go. This is it. And, but I will say, I mean, everybody there generally was a guy at that time. And so, and it was hard being, even though it was amazing, it was hard being a 19 year old female in that environment. Cause I felt like no matter what I did, there was like a 19 year old guy that was there too. And he was sort of the wonderkind. And I felt like no, I'd never been hit on really before. You know what I mean? And like, so again, trusting my instinct of like, I, I literally, I, I, I'm not trying to belittle my, I look kind of like Barb from Stranger Things through high school. And like all of a sudden, I think I bloomed a little bit. And then I'm in Chicago. I'd never had any male attention. And then they were all kind of, they're older than me. And I was a 19 year old girl, like, you know, and I was just wanted to go like make stuff and like oh, be their peer. But that was like, I, again, trusting my instinct. I was like, and they also wanted the, the, their respect so much. Like I wanted them to think I was funny. And, and from, and again, I know it's possible to do it because Amy Poehler, like I left and she did like, it's possible to do it. But like, I just knew for myself, 
I didn't know how to navigate that environment. And I didn't know how to thrive in that with in that in the skin that I was in. I did not know the path for how I could go creatively take up the room on the stage in the way that I wanted to that wasn't just like girl in sketch like female girl and you know what I mean yeah, of course. so so I left and I went to New York and again that was sort of protecting even though it opened my eyes it was also going and I'm not going to get there like this is not I I can't personally I didn't I didn't feel like I could do what I I had to get out of there yeah, so yeah. I went to I went to New York and I got an internship at Conan the first year when it was like when it was like getting like picked up like four episodes at a time remember when like remember when everyone was like who's this guy you know and I was like he's really but like they were the only people that wrote me back like I wrote to like Letterman and I wrote oh, to wow. like yeah yeah like I couldn't you know this is all before the internet so like I couldn't like I think I applied to like 30 internships and the only one that was like, all right, you can come interview was Conan. And so, cause it was like, I think so unpopular, <laughs> <laughs> but which actually was like the amazing. I really lucked out because like anybody with any connections was at Letterman or like at like, you know, at the other shows. And like, so, so I was delighted and, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, I was failing in college, but like, I'm a smart person. I was, so all of a sudden I was not depressed and I was doing what I wanted to be doing. I'm a good worker. I'm smart. And so like their in, other interns were like ding dongs. And so I was capable. And so then I got way more access. I, they just want, I got to be like down on the stage and in the control room. Cause I was the one that they could count on to get shit done. So I had all this access, like and it was also, again, like their first batch of interns. There was like two of us that were capable and the other one became like a um, modern family executive producer. Right? Oh, no. Does that mean he's not capable of like yeah. modern family? Yeah. yeah, no, no, the two of us, there was two of us that had our shit together. <laughs> yeah, then they should um, like the biggest sitcom on yeah, modern yeah. family. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was so cool because then it was also like fascinating to watch a, a, a blossoming show. And again, with the town from... A, it was just trusting my instincts that was like, okay, I need connections. Like I need to see how, so I trusted, like, so I knew, I didn't, I knew I had to get an agent and I was like, let me just go work in production and see what this is. And so, you know, I, I, I learned how a TV show was made. I learned how to behave on a set. I saw, I saw what everyone's jobs were, you know, um, like how, a t like how, like, what everybody behind the scenes did with all those job titles. When you see the scrolling credits, I saw what every, I got to know what everybody did. Um, it was, I was the assistant to the script coordinator. So she would be like right on the stage while like Robert Smigel was rewriting. And she was like, so I just got to be right there while it was all like rehearsing, like the insult dog and like all of it. It was like, just, I feel like there's been so many times I've been the kid at like the right place, the right time, like watching all of this. Um, and, and just like, be, and the whole thing is like, honestly, if I'll, like, just be cool. Just be, show up on time. Don't be chaos. Be cool. Just like, who, you know, I was the copy machine gal. I was like, I learned how to like deal with like toners and copy jams and like, but I was, I, I fucking figured it out. Like. Did I want to be that? Like, no, but I figured it out. Like, I was cool. I didn't take up all the air in the room. Like, I'd be fun if you talked to me, but I wouldn't go in and make you talk to me. Like, I was like, as good at the copy machine as I could be and, like, got the scripts to every, like, you know, it doesn't matter what you're, if you're getting coffee, just get the right coffee. Like, show up. You're not going to be getting coffee forever. You'll, in fact, you'll move up quickly if you're cool and capable and like can show up and be, people just want to trust you like and 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 have you not be annoying. And that's like 90% of the battle. Okay. I love this. I wrote down, I think, 12 points just on what you said. But it's <laughs> so true that, you know, I back in my previous life as an accountant, the manager, we went out for drinks and he told everyone, he's like, Michael is... He's like, guys, give Michael a grad job. Give him a grad job. No one was speaking. He's like, he's normal, guys. He's normal. And it turns out the only reason that I got the grad job when he was slurring his words was purely because I was normal. Not yes. because maybe I'm the smartest person in the room or anything. I was normal. Yeah, I can see you very. Yeah, yeah. 
Cause just cause I like fit in and I was watching and observing and I knew when to speak and when not to speak. <laughs> I mean, 90% of the battle is like, you want to be able to trust that somebody can be in the room. Cause like also like superstars were coming in. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if like a celebrity, we'd celebrate, like you wanted somebody who could just be cool. If they had to go refill the cheese platter in the green room and not be like, Oh my God, I love you so much, Adam Sandler. Like, <laughs> You know, like, just don't say it. Don't ask for a photo. Just be cool. Like, and just be a, a fun hang. Oh. Just, yeah, just be a fun hang. Just like, just, even if you're freaking out internally, act like you're supposed to be there without being a jerk about it. Like, be gracious and just, and like, and don't be a jerk. Like, if you got to go get somebody's laundry, just go get the laundry. Like, who cares? You sound like a superhuman because you've come from a small environment. So typically people in their bubble only know their bubble. I know that you're living in New York. It almost sounds like you didn't care. You just knew what you had to do. So whatever happened was just the right path for you. So for example, you're applying for all these internships, you get one, but it seems like you focus on the one that you get, not the 30 that you didn't get and that everything was just leading you to where you needed to be. Did you have that foresight? Did you have this pressure or you were just kind of going with the flow? I mean, you know, I feel like, I have a scrappiness. And so I think it's important to not hang on. Like this is a life in general is a marathon. You know what I mean? And if you are, if you're ambitious and you have dreams, like I think you have to be able to pivot and, and adapt and like not be super thirsty, but be resilient and like, and you have to be able to let go of the things that didn't call you back. Cause 99.9% of the things are not going to call you back. So, so if you hang on to all those hurts, I think half the battle, like, you know, eventually when you start even getting at at upper echelons, like, like, I I really think a large part of the job is not getting hardened, not losing what was sort of magic about you in the first place, because you've gotten, you know, because there's always going to be somebody that's, more successful than you or like that has exactly like that you can always compare and despair you know so i do believe a little bit of like grow where you're planted of like okay well this is where i'm at like ultimately i think you you have to make the best i think if you stay resourceful but not desperate um and then you know sort of dive into where you're at. And so I do believe it was very interesting. It was very cool to see how a show was made. And I, and I actually got to know Conan a little bit. And then he had me on as a guest a couple of times. And I actually just saw him at a party. I saw he and Robert Smigel at a party like a month ago with my friend. And we had such nice chats and they were like, we always thought they were like, you were always like so funny. Like it was just really like, you know, I think I had more access to people because it wasn't year 13 of a show. It was like week 13 at most, you know? So it was, um, you know, I think I used to feel like I've done some plays in New York and I think early on I felt like ashamed that I didn't go to Juilliard or Yale or whatever. Like, and then I did plays again later on and I was like, I remember feeling so much more confident and having, I was like, well, I've headlined as a standup and I've been alone on stage with like drunk people at Crackers in Indianapolis at the late show on a Friday night. And I guarantee you that's way harder than doing Shakespeare, like for like, you know, rich old patrons. If I can like (laughs) keep my poise with like hammered people at like Zanies, like I think I deserve to be here just as much as you, you know what I mean? Like, but I was the one that needed to learn how to say that like you know everyone's path is their path there's so many examples of where people for example don't get their first choice something happens and then they're much better off for it like uh talking about improv colin mockery from whose line is it anyway yes. i think he was rejected and he's been on this podcast he was rejected twice before he got on the show but that would yes. have made him better at his craft yes. it's not yes. the end unless if you want it to be but if you love it then it's going to push someone like you in a better direction, hopefully. I've booked things that I got rejected from. I've booked things. They've started filming with somebody. They fired them and then they called me. And then like, 
I, I've booked, th I have gotten things, and I remember, and both of them, I remember thinking, well, you're wrong. That, <laughs> that's my part. And that you like, you know, you're, you're wrong. And then like, so I've had flat out no's that then I've gotten, you know, so, oh, you know, I mean, I was on a show that we got, I was on, I was on a show called Insatiable on Netflix. We did for the CW that did not get picked up. And I remember our showrunner was like, don't like, had like a text thread. She's like, keep the faith. And we were all like, what are you talking about? Like it didn't happen, you know? And then she called, she's like, we've been picked up for like whatever, 13 episodes from Netflix. And we're like, like about like three months later, you know what I mean? And it's like, that's well, so I'd crazy. mourn that. I gave up on that months ago. <laughs> like, so that's when, when you know, with our Zoom link, we had a little Zoom link mishap. But like when you were saying, I would say very zen so about like, what? No, but like, I don't know. Like, I don't, I, you know, I, I just sort of figure everything unfolds how it's supposed to unfold. I don't, I, I don't, I, I try to be a very go with the flow person. Okay, that is a trait that I look very forward to mastering. And I think that's key in this industry. <laughs> I'll backtrack onto um, that show in a second, but with, for example, with me, when I wanted, when I started pursuing this craft, I was so serious. It had to go this way. If I didn't get this, yeah. then how was I going to be this screenwriter and creative person? And then very quickly you learn that if you have that mindset, it's not going to work out for you. But there are times when, for example, me, and I know other people have experienced this as well, that when we feel the pressure to produce or get something, it takes away from the play and the fun. But because yes. from what I'm hearing, you're very go with the flow. You know, you've got a great work ethic and you've achieved an enormous amount. I would assume you've had to be aware of the play and the fun concept along the way. It's something I've really very much, I actually feel like the pandemic really helped me with that Ooh. because, yeah, I think um, when you're lucky enough to do what you, what was your hobby and then it becomes your job, and when your job is fun, and and I have a, I do have a good work ethic. I do think for a while I I think I became a workaholic. You know where there was some part of me that only felt truly okay if I had a job lined up or if I was working. You know what I mean? Like, yep. and um. And there was something so freeing about the pandemic, which was horrible, horrible for everybody. But like about, I feel like A, everything kind of being going more virtual. I used to be like so afraid to leave town for stretches of like, what if I miss something? And like, you know, it felt very almost like fear-based way to live of like, I would only travel if I was like working or going to a wedding or visiting family, but it would never just be for fun. Like I'd like to go to Australia because I've never seen it. Like, like there had to be something productive with it or like checking off a box of seeing somebody. Like, yep. like, like I think that it has been helpful that like, well, everything's self done now anyway. Like, and, and I think there was something about, um, you know, I, I lost both my parents right before the pandemic and, uh, there's, and I just, you know, you sort of see how short life is and it's sort of, and my mom was so fun and there was a part of me that's like, I want to make sure I, cause she, she packed it all. Like, I just thought, like, I want to make sure I am not, I'm like a human being, not a human doing like, and that like, I'm actually like living my life. And let's just say, let's just pretend for a second. I had everything that I wanted and like, I had all the money that I wanted and all the, like, then what the goal can't just be success or checking things off the, let's just say it was, I got, let's just say I have an Oscar. I have like, it's, it's all there. Like, like, and then what do you do with your day? Like, then what? If you're not at work, then what do you do? And, um, you know, it's like, it's like I love hanging out with my friends. I love making things. I like dancing. I like doing karaoke. I started playing tennis again. Like, I, I like, you know, you know, I realized I missed doing stand-up. Like, I hadn't done stand-up. I sort of stopped on my parents because I, I just didn't feel like I yeah. felt too, like I didn't have skin. I just felt like too like tender. And then the pandemic happened and, and I was sort of didn't ever want to do it again. And then I, then I sort of found tennis. I was never like an athlete. And so I 
like it's pu- pushing through healthy risk of like learning something and um and going i'm just doing the best that i can and this is fun and like and i'm out of my comfort zone and there are some some sort of hot heads and like that's not my problem <laughs> and like and uh and so I was like, the, I was like, can I have a different relationship with stand up? Like I used to feel so terrified of it, even though I would tour headlining it. I had really crippling fear around it. And I'm I was so like, surprised by that. Really? Yeah, because you've done so much in the stand up world as well, and you know, headlining. <laughs> you've been even like just starting out younger, and you've got all these what sounds like creepy men. I know is in the yeah. improv world, but you, just stand up can be brutal in a sense. Well, that's why I stopped stand up. I didn't do stand up. I only did sketch and improv. And then Bobby Lee did an intervention on me. Like, oh, really? I was, yeah, because it was too creepy. Like when I was doing, that's how I got my agent. Was I was doing stand up in New York. I was um, interning for a casting director, and I was an elf at Macy's, Santa Land, and waitressing. And then I would do stand up at night. Oh, that's great. And and then. But I like I knew I could write for myself, so I did stand up, and, and I was like twenty one. I knew there weren't that many young women at the time; there were very few like doing it. So I knew I could probably get stage time. But like, yeah, the world is just it just was like at that time was like oh. So I just so I thankfully I got an agent quickly, and I booked a sitcom. And I was like, I'm never doing stand up again. <laughs> and then Bobby Lee, uh, Bobby Lee did an intervention who I adore, and he was like. Oh, I was living in New York and flying back and forth to do Chelsea Lately every other week. And I loved doing Chelsea Lately, but like we made like $300. And so I would pay to fly myself in. Do my, And again, he was like, Arden, he's like, you're the only person. He's like, all these people on here are stand-ups. He's like, do you know how much money I make on the weekends just by promoting it on this show? Like I, he's like, you have this, Genius. you did four years, four years with me on Mad TV. You've done like a hundred Chelsea. You're the only person not making, everyone's making the money on the weekends. Like you're the only one not <laughs> Like not, so at first he was like, he's like, he goes, it was me and Jordan Peele. He goes, Arden, you and Jordan, this is obviously pre Oscar Jordan Peele, but we had been on Mad TV with Bobby. He was like, okay, you guys are going to open for me at the Ice House in Pasadena in three weeks. You each have to do 10 minutes. So, like, wow. get your shit together between now and then. So, he, I, I'm so thankful for him. And he brought me to his house and he gave me a lesson. He was like, Are you a mic in the stand, stand up? Or are you a take the mic out and move it? He goes, I think you're physical. He's like, You take the mic out. So, then he goes, So then you take the mic stand and you put it behind you because then we can't see you if the mic stand is there. Like, all the things. He gave me a little mini, like, literally the like kindergarten stand-up lesson and then he, and then jordan and i remember we drove together and we opened we did each did a set opening that weekend like for the weekend we did a couple shows opening for bobby at the ice house but like um and then i started doing stand-up but i still had like crippling fear of it <laughs> and so it's been interesting coming back and going just for the balance of like in my life of like, can I do, can I do this and have a different relationship with this? Can I do this and just tell the truth of where I'm at? Can I do this and have fun? Can I do this not out of fear because I'm supposed to, but because I want to and to go have an experience with the people that are there. And I I feel like in a weird way, when you lose a lot of things or like when you lose people and when you lose, like there's a certain freedom of like, it's it's like the worst, but then you, I also have had a lot of very like magical dream. things. Yeah. Cause you're like the gift of it is like, I feel like your body. And I think we all had this with the pandemic. Like I, I used to be such a people pleaser and I think your body knows what you want to do. Like, I think your body knows who you want to work with, who you want to hang out with, what I, if you, what dinner you want to accept to go out with friends and what, you, what you feel like you should do, but you don't really want to do it. And like yeah. <laughs> when I lost my parents and then like all that, so I was like, I literally couldn't say yes to the shit I used to say yes to that I didn't want to. So it like eliminated the gift. shit that I didn't. Yeah. I was like, I can't fake it any. Like I will only, so everything that's sort of in my life now and the balance of it, like is all the stuff that I want to be there. And I think it also, like it has to be like whether I'm working or not, like the pandemic slowed everything down. I have to be okay whether I'm working or not. Like I have to, like, I think what the whole point of like, I think it's to be like happy, joyous and free. Like we are all here to sort of participate, share some joy, share some love, make our mark, but like have some fun and, and like have some adventures and it, you don't have to be the most, you don't have to have achieved your dreams to still earn a fun 
life. Like it's okay if you have unfulfilled expectations of yourself. You're still allowed to have fun along the way. I think it's so important, even if you are, even if you are working like as an accountant and you perhaps want to be an author or a writer, you can still do it um, in, in your other time. Um, yes. So that's a, there's so much that one can do. And just hearing, like you've literally given a TED talk here and I've wrote down so many <laughs> points, but the hobby, I'm just going to quickly like jump through them because I've got so many questions. The hobby side, and it's so important, especially when you, your hobby becomes your, um, your job. That changes yeah. the whole dynamic. And we've spoken about that a little bit on this podcast, but doing other things yes. brings back the joy as well as probably makes you more creative as well. And it takes your mind off things. You don't go in a hundred percent with laser like yes. linear focus. I, I've never found, you know, it helps at times you need to do that, but sometimes we need a bit of a break and it brings in more. We're more than the sum of one in a sense. 100%. I think, you know, I realize in this, tennis is the first hobby I have not monetized. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, yes, like, yes. I, like I let, <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. Arthur Ashe Stadium, I've got my eye on you. You'll beat the, um, the... Yes, oh my God, I'd be so psyched to be a tennis champion. Are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> Smash the Williams sisters. And beat yeah, both of them. oh my God, are you kidding me? I would thrive. <laughs> um, no, I, I, you know, I love design. I like doing house design stuff. And then like my friend like hired me to do their house. Like, you know what I mean? Like, Whoa. like I've been lucky enough, like to, there's like, you know, I love to do the, my podcast. I started out just for fun doing about like the bachelor and then like, you know, and now it's like seven years in and I'm glad to be, I mean, I had to start my mom glad because it takes up so much time. I'm glad I earned from it, but like everything I kind of did for fun, I monetized. That's so great. Is that the, uh, what's according it and has, Will, um, you, will you accept this rose? Yes, Padgett Brewster. I think she spoke about yeah. it in this. She loves it's it. It's so fun. Oh, my God. It's so – we do we do Bachelor Australia and Bachelor in Australia. We had to stop doing it because uh, – oh, Jim Jeffries is a regular. He does it all the time. <gasps> I, that, okay, I can't imagine those two together. <laughs> oh, my God. Jim and, Jim and Padgett have been in, in this garage together. Oh, that's amazing. I would love I to love see I love him. That. I'm obsessed with him. I was on his show on FX on Legit and, like, he messaged – me he dm'd me he was like you know i watch the bachelor i was like no i was like do you want to come to my garage he was like yes and, so I was like, <laughs> and he oh my god yeah he's like a regular on it i'm obs- at, he, we love jim jeffrey I love I, I can't oh I, <laughs> i'd love to hear him talk about the bachelor that would be oh my hilarious. god you should go back we, there's a bunch of yeah we didn't like we didn't capture him until like a year ago so he's like a newer addition but um, yeah, but we've, but we've, no, we've watched all the Bachelor Australia, Bachelorette Australia, Bachelor Paradise, you know, about Osher, Osher, Osher Gunsberg. The, the, yeah. Osher Gunsberg. Would you get I him mean, on? He lives in America, I think. What? He did Does definitely. He? I don't know where he is now, but he lived okay, in LA okay. for a bit, I think. Okay, okay. I mean, happily. Are you you, for you sure. have to do this. Do this for it's me. Been, oh my God, it's been hard to like. It's hard for us. We love Bachelor and Bachelor in Australia. First of all, you guys aren't as trashy as we are. Every, like, you don't even have, like, fantasy suites. People do not sleep together. Ours are like, when can we bone? When do we get to the fantasy like suites? Yeah. Oh, my God. And then, but you guys are like, well, we were dated for the entire season, bless you, but we never kiss. Like, out of Australia, they never even, like, kiss. And I'm like, God, like, everybody, like, has such, like, self-esteem and boundaries. <laughs> I also kind of like, so many tattoos, so many, like, so many sleeves of tattoos of the guys, the guys, like, so many neck tattoos, all of it. Like, we were, we've been obsessed. We love do, it. But How do you find the Australian Bachelor? It's hard to, for, it's hard for us to watch them because, we, like, we have to have, like, a VPN. It's hard mm-hmm. to get access to the episodes. Australian Bachelor... Um, they all, all the guys, I feel like all their names are like Maddie J, Maddie B, <laughs> Maddie Z. And they're all like, kind of like hot Damon. bland. Yeah. They're like hot bland. Very, they're very into like thrill seeking. Like you better like jump out of an airplane and you be, better be willing to like, <laughs> sk- sk- like very much. They said crazy shit where they were like. Here's two high rise buildings. And we're gonna put a, a wire between them and then string a that you know that um that game like that what is that game like when you were kids? Twister. 
they did, there was two high rise buildings and they strung two wires between them and they put like a cardboard twister game between these two no. high rise buildings on a windy day and then they wheeled this bachelorette and this bachelor out into the wow. and it was like bouncing and they were supposed to do like twister like 15 stories up and she understandably freaked the fuck out and they had to like <laughs> they had to like wheel them back in and i remember thinking what intern had to like test that <laughs> twister like that would have been me they would have been like arden you go out like <laughs> that with your fake id go out and <laughs> do the twister game like it was so dangerous it's very um extreme sports when i watch the bachelor australia the guys are very very, hot call. very uh, extreme sports my um claim to fame is there's this really uh it's a, a middle-sized gym and yes. it was a gym where you had to have a pt so everyone kind of knew each other and one of the bachelors sure. owns it and he was always there i don't who? watch the bachelor who, who, who? Who? i didn't see i did not see his season i was might nice? blur out his name but okay was um, he nice I'm going to blur out his name. <laughs> okay, great, great, great. Tell me everything. No, there's not too much, but I just remember, well, there's a few, but I won't get into it. We were, <laughs> it, everyone would be like, oh my God, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so. And they kind of come up to him. And I was the yeah. only one that wouldn't go up to him because it was a small yeah. gym. You're and, like, I'm not giving it to you, sir. Well, I don't know who he is. I don't, I don't watch the show. And yeah. he was livid. He, I was the only <gasps> one. He yes. hated that. And so That's he would so come up great. to me and be like, yes. how are you going? And talk to me. I'm like, yeah, not too yeah, bad. Yeah. If I'm yeah, at yeah, gym, yeah. I just wanted, I'm not being rude. I'm just doing my thing. And he yeah. hated it. I just oh always my found God. it Good funny. For you. you held your power. I you did. held your power. Even though he's like 10 times the size of me and a very powerful man. He's actually quite a nice guy. They're all like Thor. All the guys yeah. are ginormous. That's like that the, they have. The... <laughs> yeah, they're gigantic. I enjoyed, I have to say, I'm very much... Um, enjoyed my time uh, watching all. I, I if only we watched them through this illegal website that that would then like infect all of our listeners' computers. So we had to stop doing it because uh, really? we just couldn't get access to the shows. But we happily would watch all of them. We loved it. You should reach out to them. They'd love that. It would be great promo for them as well. You think? I, oh, think I could try. I would try. love it. I would yeah. try because I'm like. It's really fun. I very much. I want to watch the one that was the bisexual bachelorette where there was men and women competing for her. Oh, I didn't. I heard about oh, that yeah. one. Oh, yeah. Thrilling. We'll, we'll chat off air and I can see if I can find someone. But I really That'd be think exciting. that would be a good promo. I've written down so many points. Great. Before that, something that has definitely caught my eye. You know, you've spoken about your family coming from your upbringing, dealing with the rejection side and fear. Fear is like my number one topic. You... Uh, very self-aware and you would have had to do a serious amount of work on you. What the hell have you done? Have you been in years in therapy? How did you like, figure all of, this, all of this out? I did do some therapy. Yeah, I did do some therapy. Um, you know, I sort of pieced together, I think in my 20s, like very early on, I booked a sitcom and it was scary because like I had every, I, I quickly got what I wanted on paper. And I remember early, like I like started crying one day and I couldn't stop. Like I, and it was scary to me because I had everything I thought I wanted. You know, I was like 22 or 23. I immediately booked the show and, and it did sort of force me to look under the hood a little bit and be like, okay, to see where I would set myself up and where, yeah, I did some therapy. I did therapy and like, I'm not in therapy now, but like it, it was learning to sort of trust my instincts, learning to, you know, um, I definitely had a tough dad. Like my mom was the best. I mean, that's what happens when you marry on a dare too. Like you have two very <laughs> different people, <laughs> <laughs> but like it's two very different people. Like he didn't want kids and she, so she did most of the parenting, but he was around and he was just nasty. And I think again, just like getting out of that house and learning like a lot of stuff that was said to me, like, Oh, that's not like, that's him. Like that's not, a, that's not true. And he, that's, that's him. Like that, I, I, oh my God, maybe all that stuff that I thought is inaccurate. You know, like that's not, that was told to me about me. It was like, that's just, he didn't like himself. And then, um, and then I think even like, you know, I didn't know anybody when I moved out here, I had this job, but I didn't know anybody. And, and it was, I'm a big believer in your, your own instincts as like a North 
like for all areas, whether it's creating something, but even in friendship of like, who feels good, who feels right? Um, who are the time goblins? Like, who do you have to, like, you know, the people that like tend to you or are draining or are drama queens or, you know, like who is chaos in a way, like, are you brave enough to not have chaos in your life? Like, I know we, all of us, I used to get stuff out of hanging out with chaos. Like there's chaos can be fun and exciting, but, and but at a certain, yeah, yeah. But like, you know, starting to, I think wanting to be happy and learning that I was allowed to have preferences. Like I was allowed to go like, I like being with this person. I don't want it. I like doing this. There's only so many hours in the week. Like, what do I want to make? And then again, I'll, I'll, you go and then, you know, as we were saying early on, like whether it's a collaborator or a friendship, like just feeling what feels like the right fit. And then also allowing some quiet time for yourself. I think that's important to have sort of a well-balanced plate of, of things that feel good. I agree. And that goes into intuition and knowing. And as you said, we all have that every single person in the entire world, but we lose it or we don't listen to it. And yeah, that's a topic for another time. But I always give this example and it's such a basic example. It's like stereotypically guy and girl go on a date. <clears throat> I don't know what's happening with my voice. Guy and girl okay. go on a date and the girl just doesn't feel it. The guy might be nice and charming, just yeah. doesn't feel it. And then they, you know, she breaks it up or whatever it is. And it's just that feeling, you know, it wasn't right. The guy might've been perfect on paper, but it wasn't right. And that's trusting and backing yourself. But that is, I, that, that's a journey in itself. I mean, honestly, again, like full circle, I think a lot, like the gift of the bad things. I know this is like, like I do think, you know, my dad was sick for a long time. And so that wasn't a surprise. But then my mom, she just like died, right? Like there was something about having it back to back of like these two shock, like she was just a shocker. And, you know, when you have sort of your biggest fear happen, it's either like, are you going to go to bed for the rest of your life? <laughs> or like, okay, like, you know, she wouldn't want that. And it's like, how do you put Humpty Dumpty back together again? And it's, it was like, all right, mom, like as my little sort of Tinkerbell North Star of like, let's really simplify. And like, even that first week, like my brother and I still had a little dance party. Like we still played her favorite, like single yeah. lady song. Like we still had a little, like, like even on your, your, even on the worst weekend of our lives, like we still like had a dance party. We performed the entire cast albums of Little Shop of Hearts oh, and, and Jesus Christ Superstar in the living room. Um, you know, like, like it's that I think for me, life is all of it. It, it doesn't, it, it's everything you can, you can be, whether it doesn't even have to be such an extreme thing, but like you can be dissatisfied or like, but you still can have some fun too. Like it can be, you can hold two opposing things at once, I think has been a huge thing. I think having such an extreme thing happen so fast has really showed me the importance of, I needed more balance. So it was like, I've started having more dinner parties. I do like karaoke stuff. I'm going trips with my friends. I make sure I travel, plan fun trips with my friends. I have a whole, I'm going away for August. I've got like four friends that I'm meeting different places. Um, and like, we're literally just going to go ride bikes, play tennis, watch trash TV. Um, I'm doing a bunch of stand up again. Um, you know, like it's all this of, you know, you're powerless, but you're not helpless in your life of like, what, who, who do you kind of like that you, you can call and initiate and go to the movies with somebody and you can set up like a taco night with somebody that you still have some agency. You know, do I wish I was on some hit HBO show right now? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, I'll, I have an audition I'll work on later and I'm going to do stand up tomorrow night and I'm going to, Lauren Lapkus and I are writing a script. Are we going to sell it? I hope so. Maybe yeah, not. We will. We're going to sell it, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> obviously, we're going to sell it. <laughs> obviously, that's a yes. Yeah, but, yeah. Like, but I've had other things that I've written that I didn't sell. You know what I mean? It's like, and so it's just participating in life. I'm also a big believer in, 
Financial fear, like it's okay to have a day job. I want to just say to anybody out there, there is nothing wrong with a day job, honey, because if you put or another stream of income, you are, there is not, you are not a, there is no, there is no shame in your game if you have to do something else. Like, because in this day and age, if you want to perform, everybody has a cell phone. Everybody can make fun videos. Anybody can do a coffee night, at, like a comedy night at a coffee shop. Like you can put on, you can do a thing in your yard. Like, and it's okay if you have, if you're a waiter, if you're a Lyft driver, there's nothing wrong with having income so that you're not like forcing your dreams to support you. Like, you're like holding it by its throat against the neck. It's okay to do what you got to do to get your, to, to, to pay for yourself. So there's lightness if you go in for an audition or you're trying to do that festival or like you don't need it to cover yourself. Yep, like whatever you need to do to set up, like it's important to be, it's okay to have a job so that you're not demanding, you're not strangling your dreams. And, and people feel that as well. People talk about in the audition rooms or when you come in, like I need this job or, you know, back to the date example, like I need you to be my boyfriend or girlfriend. Yeah, people right. sense it and it's a bit gross. But something yeah. I've heard you say a few times um, elsewhere is, you know, talking about your family and going through like grief and even rejection yeah. and all of these things. I love this quote that you always say. It's you have to feel it to heal it. And I think that's yeah. so important. Tell me your wisdom. How did you f figure this out? I mean, honestly, I was surprised when my dad died because he was literally dying for 30 years. Like, and he was like the boy who cried wolf. And I'm not saying that I wanted him to die earlier, but I literally was brought to say goodbye to him in the hospital the first time in sixth grade. And he died in 2017. So like, wow. he literally was like that close to die. Like I have said goodbye to him, like actually goodbye in a hospital room that many, like that many times. I'm not exaggerating. And so, so the, it was somebody that I always kind of knew and then he lived for like 30 more years, you know, so, which was like, and I was, and he was not a kind man. He was pretty cruel. And so when he passed, you know, I was in acceptance that it like our, like I, I tried with him. Like I was in accept, like I, I was surprised at how much grief I had. Like, even though I had done the work, I had done the, th like I sort of, if it was going to happen, it would have happened. It didn't, it never happened with us. And I was surprised. I thought it would be nothing but like ding dong, the witch is dead or whatever. And like, I was really sad. I was surprised how much sadness I had of just of what, of like what never was like, it never happened. He, for whatever reason, I was just never his cup of tea and, and how, like the, how sad that was. And then and then I was like feeling better. And then when my mom died, like she just died making breakfast like a year later. And like, I remember I didn't want to fucking deal with this. Like I just come out, like my dad died episode, episode, episode one, season one of Insatiable. And then my mom died. We were back in Atlanta and we were, I, they found her episode one, season two. And, and I remember just being like, fuck this. Like I had just... I had just like come out of it. Like I was doing better. It was my time to be the fun coworker. Like not, they never knew me without like a newly grieving parent. Oh, wow. And so I actually have a very soft spot in my heart for like a lot of that cast. But, um, oh, that's nice. you know, yeah. But I will. So here's the thing. So here's what I did. You take it or leave it. Here's what I did. Um, Unfortunately, did I want to grieve again? No. Did I want to grieve my dad? No. I did. I felt like he didn't deserve it, but I felt like I had grief. So I was the one with it. So it's like if I if if I didn't deal with it, I would probably have spent all my money, gained fifty pounds, and like gone to bed. Like so I would have. I, I tried to do no harm to myself or others, you know. And so I. Um, so here's what I did. I literally was like, I found a therapist in Atlanta because we were filming in Atlanta. And I was like, okay, I, I think I signed up for three times a week. And um, so I knew I could had scheduled times to go cry. I would go like, oh, I, yeah. And, but there's also, if you can't afford that, there's grief groups. There's like, you know, there's grief groups that are probably like affordable. You can find, there's also a sliding scale. Thing. But I was like, okay, um, I knew I needed a place where I could just go be not okay. 
Because I was also not home and I was around coworkers and I had to kind of keep my shit together. Like they're like, lady, we didn't pick you. Like we just got, we're just working with you, you know? So, um, and then within that, so it was like, I, did I, did I want to deal with it? No, but it was like, it will deal with it until it, like, I feel like grief will deal with you until you deal with it. Like you, and so- And, and again, it, it's different for everybody, but like, I just needed to go be able to cry and be not messy and like, whatever. And like, you know, I also would allow myself to make, pl- trust my gut on like what felt fun, put things on the calendar and then cancel. If I needed to cancel, can't lower the bar. Like, and then also I would go on little daily walks. And when I say this, I walked as slow as like a 900 year old grandma. <laughs> <laughs> with the giant visors that you see like oh, so I good. was like fully like just sl- shuffle and like it was like okay you know oh there's a tree that's a tree like whatever you know um it was like but it was just all going towards the surface going towards the light of like okay of the, my coworkers, Debbie Ryan was the one that was like, she was the one that really like circled her wagons around me oh, that's so, so I was like so I was like all right Debbie and I would go do, we would go like do scooters in the park. They had this band that had live karaoke. We would like, it was like just sort of risking. I set up a trip with friends. Like, like you're still alive. Like you're not, you don't have to just grieve 24 seven. You're not going to be at your best, but like, you're still allowed to be a person. <laughs> you still, you have to be with people that know that you're a Macy's Day balloon that's lost some of their handlers. <laughs> you know, but like, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you're a fucking bananas. But like, if you're with people that can handle the fact that you're a little fucking off, like, then the then you can you still can go be a human, as long as you and your again your body knows. But I do think, whether it's childhood shit or whatever, like at a certain point, you know. Like, it's okay to grieve. I, I had to grieve. Like, it sucks. That, like, my mom finally was just like, she she said, she's like, she actually made me feel not crazy the year, the one year after my dad died. She was like, because he, he, he was so cruel and it was never, she was like, I don't know why he never liked you. He just never liked, he just never did from the moment I arrived. And to hear her say it, I know it sounds like a terrible thing to hear, but I was like, yeah, I, I thank you. Like, yeah, I yeah. knew Opposite that. I gaslighting. knew. Yeah, I knew, I knew that. And I, and it, like, I'm not, cra- like, he didn't, and he just didn't. And and to also allow, like, oh, that's why I'm sad. But it, that's an unnatural thing. Of course, a child wants their parent to like them or love them. Like, and, like, to go, and that doesn't mean I'm not a lovable person. Like, 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 and so I used to feel, I used to feel, like, with my family that I was sort of like a chair with a broken leg, a four leg, but I was like, Oh no, I'm like, we're like a stool. Like, it's like me and my brother and my mom, like we're a perfect little stool and like, it's okay. Like, is it ideal? Would it have been nice to have this? Yeah. But like, do bad dads make entertaining daughters often? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't know. Like, and I say that with, um, like, it's not new news for me. Like, I think I've, I've got, like, I've done the, it's not, yeah, I don't expect somebody else to like take, fix that for, like, it's okay. I, I, it's not brand new information. I think we could talk, we'll have to do a part two cause we can talk about this <laughs> for ages. Um, but just, you know, everyone I know has a family member or a parent where things aren't in alignment and to hear yeah. you talk about it with such love, but more importantly, love towards yourself. That's really it. I really honestly, and does anybody out there listening, like, I think I used to feel like everyone had this perfect family, you know, and other people. And because I did, I grew up in the summer town where all these people came in and they seemed like rich or from New York or boss. And like, they all had complications, but I just didn't know it, you know, and I felt like my family was the one you know, nobody knows what goes on in everybody's houses. And so I just like, you know, and my dad literally was always like, who would want to marry you? I mean, he was so aggressively unkind. He was awful. And so like, like the, a very extreme version of it. So like, even if it's more subtle than that, like, I feel like everybody out there is lovable. Like, 
it's okay if you grow there's nothing wrong with you if you grew up with somebody that was like less than kind to you you didn't do anything wrong all you did was fly into that house like that's it and so I remember thinking like okay that my only part is like I was still carrying some of what he said like I still believed some of what he said about me and like like and that was the work of like sort of I pictured it almost like the UPS guy, like I had like a little apartment and the UPS guy came every day and was like, here's a package for your dad. Can, he's not home. Can you sign for him? <laughs> you know? And then like my house got crowded with all of his shit. And then I think for me doing therapy and stuff like that was like, oh, it's like moving day. I'm like, this is not, this was not mine. He had a complicated thing too. It doesn't make it okay, but it's also, I think I have compassion for like all of us out there it's okay that it hurt. Like, it's okay that like, of course, for all of us, like that you come by it honestly, if somebody said like, whatever your thing is, like you, you come by whatever little wounds you have honestly. And, but that doesn't define who you are, you know, like that you are like, you're allowed to like be, okay, this is so crazy, but like <laughs> I talk about this on my podcast. Here's my final with tennis. Okay. So I always was like, oh, we're not athletes, my family. We were picked last. My brother and I were really little and like we just weren't sporty, but we had to do sports. Like at the school, you had to do sports. We were always picked last. And um, and I just felt like nothing but a lot. So I picked tennis because at least it had cute outfits. And uh, and it wasn't like it wasn't like scary like lacrosse or it was like physical. Like nobody's going to throw a ball at me, you know. And I remember um, – but it was nothing but a panic attack because nobody ever taught me how to do it. And I would just be like, sorry, sorry, you know, because the girl, a lot of them were really good, you know, like, and like, I would just like hit the ball and go flying. And I was just like, I, I, who, I wouldn't want to play with me if I was them, you know, but like, I just felt so ashamed. So I decided to take it up again during COVID. And um, I do these clinics and I do these, my coach made me like play up. He made me play in the levels above me. And some of the people were like could be really competitive and some of some of the guys were like come on come on and like I would really f panic and have like blackout panic attacks and then I would apologize and I'd be like I'm so sorry I was oh my backhand sucks I'm sorry I'm sorry and then my friend who was like like it, my friend Steph who was like you know I, this was literally I started it again in September so it's like nine months ago she she grew up playing. So it felt almost like the captain of the varsity team had chosen me to be her friend. She just liked me. And I remember I spent New Year's with her this year. And she was like, all right, Arden, your only resolution is this. She's like, I'm giving this to you. She's like, your game is actually fine. You're fine. You wouldn't, they wouldn't let you play at that level if, if, like, they, if you couldn't hold your own there. She's like, everybody hits the ball out sometimes. She goes, but every time you say, because we play in teams. She goes, every time you say to the, your team, my backhand sucks, everyone around you believes that you, and then they don't trust you. And you're putting arrow, you're giving them arrows to shoot you with, and you're putting blood in the water for them to attack you because you're telling them what's wrong with you. She goes, so you're, she's like, so you're, only thing, you're never allowed to speak against yourself on the court again. And, and every time you want to speak against yourself, you have to say, I'm becoming a champion. I'm becoming a fucking champion. You are becoming a champion. There's something I'm like, I'm becoming a champion. She's like, you're becoming a fucking champion. So I've done that. And this year, I've literally, I've never spoken against myself on the court again. But it's also, I feel like in all areas, you're not saying, I never said I was Serena Williams, but it's like everybody hits it out. Everybody has some fucking bad parent or weird brother or crazy uncle. Like, you don't have to tell everybody everything. You don't have to like, not everybody knows about like that you shat your pants in gym class in third grade, whatever your fucking thing is, or whatever your dad said or whatever your third grade teacher said, like... You're not that person anymore. Like, you're becoming a fucking champion. And it's like, you don't have to talk people out of you. And for that was me going back to stand-up. Like, I, I used to panic doing stand-up. And some of it was like, 
All right, I never said I never said I was Jim Jeffries. Like I never claimed to be Jim Jeffries. But like, can my voice be enough? Can I grow where I'm planted? Can I? Do I have value? Like, can I just tell the truth of my story of where I'm at? And like, I never claimed that I was like. So can I just be where I'm at and work on where I'm at? And it's been like I'm becoming a fucking champion, and it's been going so well. And I feel like the simplicity of like there's a warrior aspect and there's a simplicity of like in all areas we all have our past wounds like you're all becoming fucking champions even if you're like doing the night shift to like whatever like cleaning a toilet at wendy's like you're fucking champion because you're paying your bills and you're doing what you got to do and like that's a champion move and that has helped me so the simplicity of that has really helped me of like no i'm not going to go against myself again i'm the one that's going against myself and i'm not doing it anymore you are amazing. <laughs> that is, oh, okay. Wow. We're doing a part two. That is. Wait, wait. The, wait here's my champion. I have my friend brought trophies. Oh, okay. <laughs> Life advice, not just tennis advice. You can apply it to everything. <laughs> yes. I'm a little worried about time for you. Okay, so, great. Um, okay, everyone has to get your book because just hearing, it, we've only like touched on a few th- aspects. Tell me just. A little bit about, yes, the book's over there for those that are watching. Little, little Miss Little Compton. <laughs> it sounds amazing. And I just also find it crazy that I think it took you eight years to make, or am I hearing that it took eight years or something? Well, and then... it was, I, it took, I, my initial, yes, I, my initial proposal, like it had sold and then it didn't sell. And then I tried again and then, um, and then I wrote this essay that went viral. And then this book agent was like, I want to take a, a essay out, a book out with you. And I was like, I'd already given up. I was like, fuck this. And then, and then I thought, no, similar to stand up. I was like, okay, well, like 10 years, like 10 years had passed. I was like, okay, what's the 20, it was at that time, 2018, 2019. I'm like, for the proposal, I was like, what's the 2019 version of myself? Like, what book would I want to do now? You know, because the world had changed. Instagram had sort of gotten more popular. People were, because at the time, like, I wanted to do something more honest. And people, like, it was like, no, it just has to be, like, fun, whatever. Like, I wanted to tell more honest things. And I think people actually now demand that. Like, they they don't want to just hear the fluffy shit. And so um, I was like, let me just be brave enough to, let me see if I could obviously make it entertaining but like let me see if I could tell the truth of my story like let me write a new completely new proposal for a different book even though it's still my story but like so then I took it out and uh we took it out to lots of publishers and I was home the morning of my mother's funeral driving to my town center which was two miles so we I think I've been rejected from like 20 publishers and I got this email that morning that was like, hope you're having a great morning on the way to the church. <laughs> it was a five minute drive. Yeah. They were like, hope you're having a great day. Have a great week. We want to buy your book. We're so excited to do your book. The day the, I found out going to my mom's funeral that I sold the book. And then I was like, so then I called them like the next week or emailed or whatever. Cause again, I allowed myself to eliminate anything. Like I had to go, like, I was like, do I want to write this? Do I want to write a book right now? Like, and I was like, yeah, I want to write a book right now. And so I called and I was like, Hey, something happened. It's going to be a much different book. My mom was not in the proposal at all, at all. Cause, and, uh, I was like, something happened. I, and my mom died two days ago and I think it's going to be a different book. And, uh, and so I went back, I took my mom's cat because nobody would take her. I went back to the Airbnb in Atlanta and I was like, all right, mom, like, let's write a fucking book and like, oh, let's see what this book is. And it became her book. And I actually think it was much more glass half full because I also had had all, she was a really specific special lady. She was like Mary Poppins. And I'd all, I didn't quite know. I mean, I knew that, but like when somebody dies, who's pretty magical. And when it's sudden and it's in a small town, everybody tells you every story about them. So I had all these things I never would have known. Oh, beautiful. And so this cat and I like went and wrote this book 
And, and again, if I'd sold it eight years ago or if I'd sold it even six months before, like all, every door that didn't, the door that opened, this is the book I was supposed to write. It was supposed to be this book, not the one 11 years ago and not the one, not the one six months, not the one if I'd sold it, you know, she died in March. I think we took that proposal out in like October. It would have been a different book. Cause I, cause I, you know, you have like six months to write it. So like it would have been, it became, it became her book. It's amazing how just hearing you and hearing you off air as well, how you have this like beautiful mindset of how everything kind of works out and how something is like a tragedy like that can actually feel such a huge positive and help so many people. That's a credit to you for being able to recognize that as well. So I think people get a lot out of it and it's just sounds so exciting as well. Thanks, Michael. That's so nice. Also, I forgot to comment. I love the design of your book as well. Oh, thank you. I, yeah, I really, cause you know, I love design stuff. So I really was like very, very hands-on with that. I was like, I don't want to be a lady in a dress, like with like a cocktail, like, oops. Like I just was like, I'm not doing that. So I had braces made and I wanted, you know, I was still a lady in a dress, but I had sparklers and then I, I love design and I love drawing and stuff like that. So I had these wonderful illustrations made and then all of them, if you read, if you read the book, like there's all these little, they're all from the book. And that was, it was, it was really fun. And I loved like getting to work with the person who made the fonts and like, it was really fun to do the design. How can people buy it for those interested? You can get it and you can get it from your local booksellers. You can get it from Amazon. You can get it. You can order it anywhere. So it's, um, there's a hardcover, there's a, there's a paperback. And then I read, I read the book. There's an audio book. If you're a. Oh, an audio book. That's also yeah. super exciting. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. That, that was intense. That was intense. It's also during the <laughs> pandemic. I had to do it on like three days. That was intense. Okay. Tell me about that. Was it just because you had so much to do? It was just, no, it was like very last minute. They're like, oh yeah, right. The audio book. <laughs> <laughs> right. We forgot about that. Yeah. We need it by Friday. I'm like, what? And then it's interesting. You work with like a producer. So I would zoom with this lady in Brooklyn from, and I was in LA and uh, it was really fun. And then it was hard. Like, cause you know, it was fun. Cause I got to do like the voices of like the people in the book and then, uh, which was fun. And then, but it's hard, like, cause it gets to spoiler alert, uh, you know, in the final chapter, it's like, it's like, it's like, we get to me selling that we get to the part cause it's a tribute to my mom. And then in the final chapter, we kind of get to my mom dies. And then, uh, so reading, <laughs> she was like, that was challenging to read that. Cause it was also not that long. I wrote, you know, it wasn't that long after. And then she was like, Hey, can we do that again? And can you slow down? I'm like, you fucking slow down. Like, like you think, <laughs> you think I can fucking get this? Fuck you. Like you read it and slow it. No. So it was, that was really, that one, this is also my New England sensibility. It was like, I'm not going to fucking cry on that. Like, you slow down. Like, that was, that one was brutal. Like, that final chapter. She's like, yeah, just like, you know, just really take your time with it. I was like, oh. <laughs> that was tough. I'd also find it, <laughs> find it funny, like, the other chapters where they're like, mm, I'm not believing you. Or can we get more enthusiasm yeah. and then yeah. notes on your book? Yeah, you're like Excuse, rude. <laughs> I don't believe you. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds very exciting. No, she was lovely. She was so sweet. Um, what we're going to do now to wrap up the podcast is to do a rapid fire segment. So okay. the first thing that springs to mind, but you can take time to think about it. Oh, actually, I wanted to summarize a few points. Um, with the improv, when you were first starting out with like, creepy guys you're being their only lady it's also a few years ago as well there's a lot potentially not working in one's favor do you have any advice to perhaps someone that's in environments like that that d does want to pursue their craft but they're in weird environments it's a bit loaded but well i mean i my friend and i um like does your own agency of like, and it sucks that you have to do this, but like, like my friend, so uh, like I say this with like so annoying, but uh, my friend and I, like again, the gift of some of the that, I mean, hopefully it's changed a little bit, but like, um, 
I mean, I think now also you can stand up for yourself more now. I think now you can be like, yeah, don't do that. Like, like, like the world is, I think the world has to listen now. Like, I think even saying like, like, yeah, I don't like when you hit on me. <laughs> like, I think now you can say it like, and people will actually care, even if they're just afraid. Like, I think it's okay to say I'm not comfortable. I don't want to just play. There was one improv guy that, this was not in Chicago. So this is not, this is not, Chicago was, lo by the way, Chicago was wonderful. But there was, I did an improv thing. A different and the guy would always make me like ardent we would do improv exercises and I was always like the whore it's like okay like now you can be like that's really not a, like I don't want I want to play a lawyer you know what I mean like I want to yeah. play a surgeon like 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 I think just speaking up but beyond that um like speak up speak up speak up number one you can you know people will actually have to listen now and also, build your own boat. Like, so my friend Lisa and I, we, we, you know, because sometimes some worlds can still be a little bro or whatever, whatever, whatever your, whatever flavor you want. But like the fun of, and again, it doesn't have to be create the world that you, whatever, like the flavor that you see is missing, the instrument and the orchestra that you see is missing. Um, my friend and I started this uh, show together that we did a monthly show at Union Hall in Brooklyn called The Party Machine. And we wanted it to be very like joyful. We had like a band with like Beyonce style backup dancers. And like we always, each one was like a different party theme. And we acted like we were party hosts and we would have costumes. And like, again, whatever, whatever gives you joy or is unique to you or say you love Marvel movies or you love whatever it is that is your thing that makes you feel the most alive and make your tail wag the most like so if, even if it's not going against somebody being negative to you but like the thing that makes you the most excited maybe try to build a monthly night around that and then if you want to do stand-up what's fun about hosting a show is you can then book people and then they'll, then oftentimes they'll book you on their shows like but you give them a chance like it's people are always happy to be booked and you get, are gracious to give them stage time and so often that times that helps the favor be repaid that would be uh, fantastic answer. and the last point i wanted to tie up was around happiness we skimmed over this and i know this is definitely somewhat included in your book and we can talk about this for another 10 hours you mentioned how you were depressed and then when you were doing conan and it sounds like you found some of your purpose and you felt like you were living your best life or living the life that you wanted to live how you just had all this happiness and i think that's remarkable it's so empowering very similar story to me happened where when i left environment i was like wow this is amazing life is so much better and so from what I'm gathering is that when you were moving towards your right direction, it felt like everything was a lot easier. It doesn't mean it was easy all the time, but you felt happiness, which is amazing. And I do think a large part of that is really, to me, I think, I'll just speak for, I think I need other people. I need, I need a few close friends. You know, the importance of, I think when we become adults, it's harder like if you move away from your childhood friends or, or maybe you change and you're not the same as you were. And you, maybe you outgrow some childhood friends or whatever. Like I think it's important to have communities of people that you have fun with. And that for me, that is, that's been a huge thing of like, and, and I've really tried to cultivate and make sure like, a, like, I feel like love isn't a verb. It's like an action. Like, am I showing up? Like, if somebody invites me, like, do I, if somebody invites me to their birthday party, do like, to make sure that I'd really try to show up. Like, to, that, or that I, you know, that s new friendships take a little bit of action, you know, and that to cultivate, like, people that are interested, friendship groups, I love an activity, you know, but like that, it's like that, for me, Ha a lot of happiness is like, what do I like doing and who do I like being around? And it's not about money. It's not about status. It's not about, it's like, who is fun? And like, whether you're working or not, whether you're succeeding or not, because your life is, it's always going to be up and down. If you judge your happiness based on your achievements, particularly in comedy or acting or writing, like I used to do that. And that's a delicate dance because it's, you're never going to always, 
I'm single for the first time in my life and uh, in my adult life. And I remember like the first time last summer, I was like out and somebody was like flirting with me and they were very young. And I was like, oh my God, like somebody's flirting with me. And I'm like, that's okay. Like I'm not doing a bad thing. And this person is talking to me and flirting with me. Like, and I'm allowed to be talking to them. And um, I think he was 26. And, and I said the, something about Sandra Bullock. And he said, oh yeah, I think I've heard of her. And I remember thinking, <laughs> I remember thinking, oh yeah, you can't be... You can't base your happiness off of achievements. When he said, I think I've heard of Sandra Bullock, I was like, okay, you got to have other stuff. It's never enough. That's such a great example. You know what uh, I mean? It's like Sandra yeah. Bullock somewhere was like, what did I do to you? Fuck a Sandra Bullock. <laughs> Seems like a nice person, won an Oscar, like America's Sweetheart, like one of the highest paid female movie stars ever. Like, cool. he doesn't know who cool. she is. Yeah. yeah, 26, I think I've heard of her. And you know what? Of course, why would he? Why would he? What would he have seen her in? Yeah. That bo- well, that blind great... box, that blind blind Netflix bird movie or whatever. Like <laughs> he probably yeah. actually, yeah. No, yeah, okay, but like, it's got to be something other than. Look, I'll always be ambitious. I'm always going to be ambitious. I'm always going to like want to make stuff. I love what I do. I love. I will always be wanting to do. There's always going to be wanting more. Uh, and. That cannot be, that's a cul-de-sac of misery. That cannot be the end game. Like what I'm excited about right now is like my friend and I are going to like have our vacation. We're going to play tennis. We're going to watch like below deck. Like we're going to go see some shows. I'm buying tickets for things like going and seeing music or like, like, or if you don't have the cash to do that, like having like just playing cards with your friend outside somewhere or like going on a walk, like whatever's fun for you. It cannot just be about status and achievement because it's, you're never going to feel, it's never going to tuck you into bed at night in a way that you laughed a lot, like enough. Well, okay. I don't, I don't have any follow up comments. Get your Ted talk. Get the book out to everyone. <laughs> I'm going to ask. The last three questions before okay. we go, you've answered the other 20 I was going to ask. If you could go back into a time when you were first starting out, what advice would you give yourself and why? Oh, that's interesting. I think two things. I would say you're enough as you are. You're enough as you are, as is. And your quirks and your little red bob and your like what your body is at the time like you know it was before there was different shapes of people on television like everybody was so like it's like you're okay and you're allowed to succeed you're not a bad person if you succeed um you're not betraying anyone if you succeed i had a lot of like people kind of like come at like i like you're not a bad girl if you shine bright and, and it's not, it felt almost dangerous. Like, so it's like, you're allowed to go for it and like, don't pull your punch. And like, if people in your life can't handle that, that's not because you're a bad person. You didn't do that to them. There were some people that didn't, that were like threatened by that. And I would get, I didn't, I felt like I could either have success or I could have like love, but I didn't feel like at the time I could have both. Like, and I think I was like, no, the people who are going to get it are going to get it. Go for it. Go for it. And, and go for it in a way. And the second thing is I think right out of the gate, I booked a lot of stuff. I think because I was quirky and different and then I got out here and I didn't know many people. And then I think I tried to blend myself down for a little bit of like, um, of, like trying to be like it's the equivalent of like don't give them what don't give them what they want make them want what you got I was trying to give them what they wanted for a little bit and I would I think I would just say like no stay the course and I think I would tell myself to do stand up earlier and like own my own voice and uh and and it's okay like it's okay to like it's okay to go for it and like you're cute enough. You're funny enough. Like just all that, like it's all enough. I think that's what I would tell myself. Oh, beautiful. And just a side comment on that. It's often the other person's insecurity and jealousy and it's not us. And yeah. I think that's very important as well. But yeah. The last question before yes, we go and we ask how people can follow you and keep up to date with you. What is the one question I should have asked you? Oh, um, 
Oh, I don't know. I don't. I feel like you did a great. I feel like we had a perfect conversation. Oh, I'm in complete you. acceptance. That is very <laughs> kind. You're sure nothing like your favorite color, anything otherwise. I don't know. Is... No, I feel like we had. I feel like we had a great chat, don't you? I feel we had an amazing <laughs> chat. I've I've been there. I've written down so much stuff. You're, you're okay. Here's my rant. You are crazy in an amazing way to have all of this insight. It's like it's like you've lived a thousand lives, and I really think that. I'm going to send you, if you want, some of these clips of you because there's just so much gold and it's so empowering. It's not dividing, Aww. which is what we need in this world. It's just, it doesn't matter. The examples you gave are holistic to everyone as well. Like regardless if you play tennis, you can apply that <laughs> mindset. You can be the champion. There's so many takeaways. I'm going to love writing up my takeaways at the end. But oh, you are so amazing. Kind. Oh, I would love that. I would absolutely, I would love that. It's so kind. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you thank you and yeah you're lovely to chat with you're very good at your job thank you i appreciate it before we go how can people follow you remind people again for the book and the podcast and okay great else. we actually have a lot of australia listeners which is fun um it's called will you accept this rose my podcast it's on um iheart radio but you can get it wherever you wherever you like to get your podcast um my book is called little miss little compton um, and if you enjoyed what you heard today, I feel like it expands more on stuff like that. Um, but it's, it's very, very so much a David Sedaris funny family, but there's a, my friend said it should be called funning with scissors. <laughs> and then, um, and then I, I'm more active on Instagram than Twitter, to be honest, but I'm on both. And my last, my name is Arden Marine. Uh, but it looks like Myron, so it's A R D E N M Y R I N. So that's all of that. Timing. I'll add all of the links in the bio <laughs> so people can check it out as well. Thank you. You're amazing. And we've oh, got a likewise. Chat soon. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. I love Arden's take on being a champion, not just any champion, but being a fucking champion. She eloquently points out that often we can speak about ourselves negatively. However, but that doesn't help anyone and in fact can steer us away from happiness. She highlights how we don't need to tell the world what's wrong with us and we should refrain from speaking against ourselves. Whenever she's feeling the negative self-talk creep back, she repeats the line, I'm becoming a fucking champion, which quickly pulls her back and allows herself to be in that positive place. I'll leave you with this epic quote by Confucius. If you are positive, you will see opportunities instead of obstacles. Thank you for listening to the Funny and Failure podcast, exploring the deeper side of comedy.